Thank you to Convergent for having us today. Um, we're gonna do something a little different for this demo. We're actually gonna talk. Um, we're not gonna show any slides. We're gonna talk about some really important topics um, relative to AI and edge inferencing and what's happening in the market. Um, I'm Cassia Hansen. I lead Intel's IoT video partner sales. I'm joined by a couple of my esteemed colleagues that I'm really excited to talk to this morning. Um, so with that said, um, the discussion is really gonna explore edge AI and the acceleration of AI and edge capabilities today in the market. Um, we'll focus the discussion on the use of AI applications, optimized CPU performance, real world commercialization, and impacts of deploying cost-effective AI solutions. So buckle up, we're gonna get started. Um, first, I'd like to uh, have each of our um, panelists here um, give an introduction and what they do in their company. And, and uh, one of them I know really well, <laughs> um, he, he works with me um, and the other we've worked with for many years. So I'm so glad to have you and I'll have AJ introduce himself first and, and then we'll get started. Hi, so I'm AJ Fraser from uh, Agent Video Intelligence, better known as Agent VI. Um, I lead business development for us globally, which tends to be new technologies, new products, new routes to market, large complex customers, anything that doesn't fit into our normal standard sales process kind of falls to, to, my, to me. Uh, Agent VI, we've been around 20 years doing video analytics, so we focus specifically in the physical security industry. Uh, and about six years ago, we started experimenting with some of the new AI technologies, better known as deep learning. Uh, and how to actually put those into commercial practices. So we've been working with Intel for several years now, have a lot of experience on how you actually deploy these type solutions and uh, look forward to answering some common questions today. Excellent. And thank you so much for your partnership, AJ. It's been a great relationship for the past couple of years with you guys. So um, with that said, uh, I'd like to introduce my, uh, my partner in crime, Tim Westman. So Tim, go ahead and introduce yourself and what you do at Intel. Thanks, Cassia. Uh, uh, as, as she said, uh, I'm her counterpart. So Cassie leads our partner sales. I lead our global video OEM sales, which means that I'm responsible for uh, working with all of our hardware customers, primarily involved in getting uh, the entire portfolio of Intel solutions designed into uh, those hardware systems such that our great partners uh, like Agent BI can take advantage of those and build you know, great applications that, that run on them. So, you know, uh, we work with, uh, with, with partners like, like Agent BI hand in hand to make sure that we deliver deliver you know, complete solutions available to the market that are optimized for uh, edge AI, video uh, analytics, and, and inference applications. So we um, you know, are seeing a lot of rapid change in the market. I mean, AJ, you know, especially on the software side, right? Relative to deep learning, um, there's just such rapid movement. And especially since COVID, I mean, we saw some of that movement, but COVID really accelerated that. Um, what kind of application analytics applications are solving real world problems today? Um, what's your perspective on that? Well, at the okay, so at the simplest level, uh, let's just so I'm going to speak specifically for the physical security industry, which is uh, surveillance, cameras, securing facilities, but it also includes how you use cameras for a lot of operational purposes. Could be counting, looking at traffic patterns for roadways. Um, and, and I'll give up the sort of the most dirty secret in our industry. Nobody's watching the cameras. If you're a city and you have 500 cameras installed at all of your major intersections, the chances that people are watching those cameras is it's obviously it's impossible. The human brain is great at looking at one image. It's terrible if I give, you know, an operator 30 camera screens on a wall and say, watch these for a stopped vehicle. Um, using an example of cities and, and roadways. So the simplest answer is what we do with, um, with AI is we write software that watches those cameras and it can detect things that the operator would miss. Again, using a simple example, we can detect very easily a vehicle that stopped on a roadway. So now an alarm can go off, an operator can dispatch a tow truck. Very, very simple example. The problem is uh, that you know while the software can do that, Traditionally, the software has also generated a lot of false alarms. And after a while, guess what? The operator stops you know, responding to false alarms. So what's happened over the last six, seven years with AI is the software has now gotten smart enough that we can make that detection. Again, it might be somebody jumping a fence at a substation, at a power utility. Uh, and we know that now a person has entered that substation and it's not just uh, a squirrel. 
mm -hmm. real example, squirrel running through the substation. Uh, so we've eliminated a lot of those false alarms, but we give the positive detection. So now people are only reacting to the situations that they need. So we use the basically computers uh, to do all the, the mundane, boring part. And then we let operators do the sophisticated you know, response part. Okay. Well, and how much of, you know, from your perspective, given some of those use cases, how much AI can be performed on CPUs before there's a really a need for additional GPU acceleration? Well, okay, so that that's a that's kind of a complicated question because, and, and I'll go, I might as well just go ahead and say I'm going to date myself right now. Thirty years ago, when I started in the industry, I was a hardware engineer working at board level chip, you know, with chip manufacturer for board level designs, and that was right about the time you were starting to hear the, the emergence of these chips called GPUs. Mm -hmm. But really, uh, you know, being a hardware guy by training, uh, I'm now I'm just a now I'm just a dumb sales guy. But then I was actually a smart hardware engineer. Uh, a GPU is still just a processor. It was just designed to do a very specific function, which was to render video for screens. In fact, that while Apple, I don't think, created the term GPU, obviously they were one of the pioneers, this idea if I can offload some of my software to another specialized processor that just draws the screens, everything's good. All right, the reason I explain that is the line for, for AI, what we do, we're not actually drawing screens we're going the other direction. We take video and we deconstruct it into something that now allows us to say, did I see a vehicle in that, in that image? So GPUs can help with that acceleration because they have some special instructions that make that run faster. But a lot of the modern CPUs have those same instructions. Mm -hmm. And so what we found is seven years ago when we started, everything we did was accelerated using GPUs. But now we're finding some situations where we can get as many cameras running on a single server with no GPUs, actually in some cases more cameras than if we ran it with GPUs. And the reason is GPUs are great, but you have to feed them. And, and so you've got side bus issues, you've got processor throughput. And again, when it used to be a GPU was drawing screens, that was fine. You fed it a little bit of information and it drew a big screen. Well, now we're feeding it a big screen of pixels and it's gonna generate a little bit of information. The whole flow is different. Um, so that line is very blurry right now. Um, you know, so that, that's not the direct answer, but it's a very blurry line, CPUs yeah. and GPUs. It, it, it is, I, I think, um, you know, from a inferencing perspective, there's so many ways that you can manage your data, right? We have just an explosion of I mean, there's over a billion cameras installed globally, right? As, as an estimate. Yeah. Yes. And, and now there's so much more data and so much you can do at the edge where you don't need to constantly send it back for training, right? You can actually process those at the edge and being able to do that without that additional acceleration, I think is is right now the, the trend with um, software partners like yourself where, hey, we're developing this so it can actually use everything that's under the hood, right? Well, uh, well, actually, if, if I could follow up, that's a great uh, comment. I'm, I'm thinking big cities where they have you know, a thousand cameras in one location, but using a, a perfect case for your example, we have a small appliance. It's actually, it's just a general off the shelf little, I think it's an i5 core appliance that we deliver to customers who only need you know, like less than 10 cameras on a site. And the truth is it doesn't really need much acceleration because we're able to do with, with just the built-in instructions and that simple iCore processor enough to run 10 cameras of analytics. Now, when we get to big customers who have thousands of cameras, they don't want that. They want to run stuff on servers. That's a different challenge. Now you've got, a, you know, you want to get as many channels into a 19 inch, you know, one new 19 inch slot as possible. And then we jump over to more like a Xeon type approach, but it's a, it's the same software, but they're actually um, accelerating in different ways. But to your point, you know, we're, we're using some pretty, you know, basic processors to do some pretty advanced algorithms now. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, that leads me to my next question for, for Tim, really. And this, this will be for you, AJ. So I'd love to hear your thoughts um, once Tim comments. Um, why, why should businesses care what kind of hardware is under the hood? Um, you know, what, what's your perspective there on the development of, of what AJ said and, and from a hardware perspective, what, what are you seeing there, Tim? Yeah, so I mean, I think AJ did a great job of explaining kind of the, you know, the, the role of the, you know, CPU versus versus the, the, the GPU and really kind of the, 
the point is that it's it's not about is one good is one bad is one right is is one wrong it's really about picking the right tool for the right job right and and as aj explained depending on uh what your use case is what your requirements are for size power performance cost you know any of those sorts of things you're going to look at the trade-offs of what is really going to be the best solution and there's never a one size fits all answer uh, to what is the best place to, to run a particular algorithm. So really what you wanna be understanding is what is the entire choice? And by the way, it's not just CPU or GPU, right? There's, there's also you know, FPGAs and ASICs and you know, other uh, you know, processors out there that can run you know, these, these workloads. And, and really the key is understanding uh, based on your requirements and, and your needs and what's going to run the application best, how do I make sure that, that I'm getting the most optimized solution you know, for my needs? So at some point, you know, what you really want to understand right, as a user is what are my requirements and then what is the most efficient or most effective way for me to get there? And, um, and again, this idea of choice and taking advantage of these different architectures, each of which has their own strengths and weaknesses associated with them figuring out what is the, going to be the best fit for, for my application. And AJ gave some, some great examples in, in terms of the difference. Sometimes you need something that is very small and very low power and very low cost. Sometimes you need something that is absolute, you know, maximum performance. And, you know, depending on where you exist on that, uh, you know, kind of spectrum of solutions, you're going to want to uh, look at, at the different options and size the right thing to, to meet your needs in the best way possible. Well, I think we're starting to see relative to the hardware. Um, I, I think that's great advice um, because I think, uh, you know, as we know in, in our business, um, you know, it all depends, right? The answer is usually it all depends. And it's how many cameras you want to run, what algorithms are you running, what are you wanting to look at, um, you know, uh, performance, you know, where do you want to run that data and, and process it? And, um, you know, we know there's this data diversification happening, right? You know, some people need to have it on the edge. Um, and some, some people want to keep certain data on prem and then some send it to the cloud, right? So there's now this, like you say, to your point, this choice, right? Um, you know, the other trend that we're starting to see, and, and I wouldn't even call it a trend. I think this is a real world, um, uh, you know, opportunity that's evolving is this AI box motion, Tim. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of partners creating AI boxes. And then of course, partnering like to AJ's point, they have an appliance. Um, and then mirroring, you know, those designs with our software partners um, like Agent BI. So what's your view on the AI box um, trend and, and, you know, why should um, some of the folks on this, on this uh, demo, you know, um, care more about it? Yeah, so I mean, AI box is probably it's, it's a term that doesn't have a strict definition. It's something that you know Intel has started to you know, use as, as terminology lately to describe uh, you know something that's really kind of a, a fixed function box that's meant to, you know, as the name suggests, run these AI workloads. But it tends to be one of the you know, kind of smaller form factor you know type devices, and it can scale from from something again that's very small uh, that that AJ described that you know could be uh, you know literally a, a, a small uh, you know, box that could be as small as a, uh, you know, a deck of cards in, you know, in some cases, all the way up to something that is a, you know, fairly good sized server. But the point being, it's really, it's really optimized for just running those, those AI applications. And so it, it has a couple of different advantages for you. It can be used in some of those um, green, greenfield kind of deployments where you say, maybe I only need, uh, you know, four or five cameras. Maybe I'm doing a retail bank uh, location, which is a fairly small footprint, only has a couple of cameras, doesn't have a very heavy uh, AI analytics uh, requirement, doesn't require a lot of local storage, uh, because most of that is sent to a central um, database somewhere for, uh, for long term storage. So a small form factor device, like I said, that could have a core i5 in it, manages those local video streams, provides your real time alerts, uh, and, and handles things uh, locally is, is a perfect solution. It could also be applied into kind of more of a brownfield approach where you have an infrastructure already in place. You already have, you know, cameras, you already have servers that are doing your storage and, and, and management, uh, but now you want to add AI analytics on top of that. So rather than doing a big, you know, rip and replace kind of application, uh, you can now start talking about, hey, I can bring this, this new box into my system that just offloads those AI analytics. So it can take those, those video streams uh, connected through the, you know, through the gateway and, and to the MVRs, um, your whatever storage solution you have in your, 
kind of in your back end and then run the AI analytics specifically. So it gives you an ability to sort of add features and functionality to an existing you know, infrastructure without having to say completely replace the servers, completely replace the cameras, completely replace uh, your existing infrastructure. So I think it's a really exciting space, by the way, but just the, the available computing and, and the power and performance. And then of course you look at the cost per stream, right? Um, it continues to come down. Um, but I also see the opportunity. I mean, um, you know, the computer vision market is uh, estimated to be what, 28 billion uh, by 2023 and, and uh, deep learning, oh no, computer vision is 48 billion and deep learning is 28 billion. Um, I mean, that, those are some staggering numbers. Um, and AJ, you mentioned, you, you know, you've been in this business quite a while. Um, you know, what is your perspective? And, and I'm not, um, I'm going to kind of throw a different question at you relative to the last year. Um, I think, you know, while most are ready to get back to normal, I think we learned a lot around the acceleration of AI, especially in security, um, you know, development of analytics and the speed by which that they were developed and put into the market to help impact the pandemic. Um, what's your perspective there? What are, what are some key learnings and opportunities you think we've learned over the last year relative to computer vision and deep learning? And, and what, are you, what are you excited about going forward um, now that we're kind of turning a corner relative to, to AI and, and security? Well, so it, it sort of goes back, you know, we, we didn't talk a lot here about, you know, what is the basics, uh, the basic of AI. Uh, and it is what you know, we we use in our industry AI because that's the marketing term. It's really what has been around for 25 years. Deep learning as a as sort of a, a method for analyzing and extracting, um, you know, specific information from what is basically large sets of of data. Um, and and I think what happened over the last year, uh, other than everybody scrambled and went through whatever forms of disruption they went through is you know, we started to see how flexible AI really is because it used to be like in, in, in the physical security industry and actually it was true of other industries I've been at. If you wanted to figure out something, you would have a bunch of smart people go into a room and write some algorithm to figure it out. And if you wanted to figure out something else, you took those same smart people and you said, go away for a year and figure out how to figure out the consumer buying behaviors at this you know, corner retail locations. Well, now with AI, but what AI really does or deep learning is you, you create a machine that can learn by being trained. Mm -hmm. So instead of having to reprogram the entire system, you can just teach it new things. So for example, when mask wearing last year became the hot commodity, everybody wanted to know people who were wearing masks. They wanted to be able to do it for search, looking backwards at the video. Maybe they wanted to be able to you know, contact employees that weren't following policies. Maybe they wanted to get an alarm if people came into their store not wearing a mask, whatever that was. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a trivial exercise for a deep learning machine. You just feed it enough valid images of people with masks. And you already had valid images of people without masks from pre-COVID and almost instantly you could teach your system how to classify um, people in a scene with and without masks. And then you can feed that into business logic, which is very easy. So AI really started to show just how flexible and how quickly it can adapt to new uh, to new use cases. That yeah. you know, mm -hmm. it, it sort of proved what we'd always thought about it, but now we had a chance to demonstrate it last year. Well, if only my cell phone could say who I am with my mask on. I'm waiting for that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, with that said, um, Tim, you know, from a an Intel, we're we're not going to get into speeds and feeds here. Um, you know, but I, I want to kind of touch on how our roadmap is evolving to support video analytics in, in real world applications to, to AJ's point. Um, you know, what are you, what are you seeing there? Um, and then what, what is your advice on opportunities relative to, you know, going forward? Yeah, and again, AJ AJ kind of teed this up earlier in some of his his comments, where you know what what we've been really kind of focused on is this AI use case and this uh, you know visual analytics uh, application has has really emerged. What we've really been focused on is how can we make 
you know, those core CPUs better at running, you know, that workload, um, you know, specifically. And, you know, what, one of the things to sort of, you know, think about, you know, in, in the context of this conversation is while we keep sort of using the term CPU, um, it's kind of, that's sort of really the old school uh, way of describing, you know, what, what, what Intel actually does, right? CPU meaning kind of just the core thing that runs the, um, uh, you know, arithmetic processing, you know, inside the system. If you look at what we actually make today, they're not really SOCs, they're not really CPUs, we call them SOCs, system on a chip. So the, the actual CPU portion of, uh, you know, the die, right, the size of the physical thing that we build is relatively small, right? What we, what we keep doing is bringing more functionality onto, you know, that, that single device. So uh, again, like in the context of this conversation of CPU versus GPU, well, if you look at all these SOCs that Intel actually sells, AJ referenced like something like the Core i5 earlier, it's actually got more of its die area dedicated to GPU functionality than CPU, right? Intel is actually in the number one GPU company in the world. We sell more than anybody. We just sell it integrated uh, onto our, our chips today. Um, but then, you know, similarly, when you look at what we're doing on the, on the CPU itself, we continue to add, you know, more and more of this functionality uh, to run those specific instructions. As AJ said, it's really just running these video analytics and these AI workloads. It's really just running a specific instruction set. So it's all about just enhancing our CPU architecture to add the instructions that run those algorithms, you know, really, really fast and really, really efficiently. So, so what you, you know, what we've been able to do is bring that, you know, capability on. And so as, as AJ described before, kind of why this is so becoming so real today is the algorithms have gotten smart enough uh, that they can actually do these, you know, analytics accurately, right? More accurately than humans can, you know, in some cases. The processing power of the of the CPUs have come up to a point where they're capable of running, uh, you know, those algorithms. And so now we've kind of reached that critical mass of, of capability in the industry where you can start to deploy these solutions uh, cost effectively, uh, efficiently, and you know, and 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 at scale that actually run the the workloads that that we need to run. And so. You know, the way that we think about, you know, looking at, at the solutions is you start by, again, you know, understanding your workload, understanding what, uh, you know, processing you have, you know, on, on your system today. And, you know, we provide, you know, lots of tools that enable customers to go off and, you know, figure that, that stuff out, right? So uh, when we talk about these different architectures and selecting the right one, uh, right tool for the right job, that can be challenging from a software perspective. So, you know, one of the things that we really invest a lot of time and energy in uh, looking at this problem is not just what we enable from a hardware perspective, you know, that's great, but unless you can unlock that capability from a software perspective, it's not very useful. So uh, we have a tool that we call OpenVINO, which is really about abstracting all of those hardware decisions effectively away from the software developer. So once you write your application uh, using this OpenVINO toolkit, we take care of all the hard stuff underneath that about running it on the CPU or running it on the GPU or running it on the ASIC or the FPGA, uh, you know, so that you don't have to do all that customization or tuning you know, or, or, or different uh, you know, problem solving you know, in that space. And then you know, from a customer deployment perspective, we have tools like a uh, you know, resource we call DevCloud, which is about then also hosting all this different hardware you know, in the cloud. So when you're also looking at, okay, well, what do I wanna actually deploy my solution on? <laughs> You can actually take that and run it, um, you know, again, using OpenVINO as, as the interface across all those different hardware platforms hosted in the cloud to understand for, for your particular application, what's going to be the, the best hardware, what are the different perfor price performance points I can kind of hit by testing it across this different range of hardware. So we're trying to make all this complexity of these you know, new and unique applications and all this different choice and all these different capabilities out there. We try to make it easy for our, our software development partners uh, to build for Intel solutions and then for our deployment partners to understand what is the right uh, landing zone for a particular application. I think that I, I think that's great. I think the integration of additional capabilities like Deep Learning Boost, for example, are really important. I think OpenVINO is so exciting. I know we I love to talk about OpenVINO. It's not opening wine. <laughs> um, it is uh, you know helps developers really create those applications, um, inferencing applications for the edge. And the the exciting thing is our uh, CPUs are optimized for Open, OpenVINO. So, you know, you pair our CPUs, OpenVINO software application, like with Agent BI, they've been a partner early on, um, you know, and then of course you look at that, that performance and the price and there's, there's a lot of goodness there. 
Um, I'm going to shift. Um, we have a couple more minutes. And AJ, I'd love to, um, yesterday we hosted a session with our vertical or industry leaders across healthcare, um, energy and utilities, um, retail, and uh, public sector. And I'd love to get your take on what you're seeing. Um, what are some of the more, um, you know, from an industry perspective, are you seeing ones that are a little more ahead or adopting some of the technology in a, in a more uh, accelerated way? Or what, what's your view on, on the opportunities in the industry space specifically? Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it, it varies well, a lot. It, no, yeah, it does, because it varies a lot by industry and what, and what they're trying to do and the way they deploy. So for example, we might say, well, cities are, are big leaders. But really, cities are leaders because a lot of times they will capitalize large budgets to just do a technology improvement to improve, improve policing, for example. But in reality, most cities, their cameras are typically connected into one or two locations. And so they're not really architecturally that challenged. Um, so they might adopt the technology because they fall in love with it. Uh, but then you take you know, a different industry that's that really compared to a city would have very boring technology like uh, utilities. But their problem is they might have a thousand locations spread across four states that they need to secure. And these locations, last time I checked substations, nobody wants them in their neighborhood. So they tend to be in very out of the way locations and they have terrible problems with theft, uh, vandalism, just goofing off kids going in there and messing around with stuff. Um, so actually, while there's probably a lot more intrigue and, and interest, you know, the cities, we're seeing more rapid success with what I would consider more mundane applications, which are just customers that have massive security challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not even mentioning, by the way, you know, we talk about, you know, cyber, you know, the cyber incident that mm -hmm. happened last week, it just reminded everybody in the world that these, you know, that these critical infrastructures, when they go down, it, it can have a rippling effect that's catastrophic. So we're actually seeing a lot more um, sort of, I, I'd say rapid deployment in more of these critical infrastructure applications because secretly they know they're, they're highly vulnerable and the price for an error there is, you know, it's, it's not political, it's, it's real. I mean, it, it can, uh, so. We touched on that yesterday as well, the cyber uh, concerns, you know, healthcare, for example, there's a lot of PII in that space. So the need to really have um, solid cyber risk mitigation um, tools right. and plans and procedures in place is so critical, especially where physical security is coming to play. The two are really, um, you know, converging and, and uh, Tim and I have uh, chatted a lot on this uh, topic. Um, with that said, um, we have a couple more minutes. I wanted to just get some final thoughts. Um, Tim, any final thoughts you have for our audience to take away? We've talked a little bit about CPU, GPU, real world analytics, industries, OpenVINO. Um, what, any, any key takeaways you, you'd like the audience to take away from this demo? Well, and, and I uh, didn't demo anything. We just talked because we all no. love to talk, but. <laughs> Well, and, and I, I, maybe the, the, you know, the final thought that, you know, I think it's just worth sort of leaving with people is, you know, we kind of teed up this, you know, this conversation is sort of like the CPU versus the GPU and, and, you know, maybe the way I will kind of, you know, bring it back, you know, home to that is really it's, it's, it's not an either or it's really about this idea of choice. And, um, you know, one of the things that, that is kind of the, the prevalent point of view, you know, in, in the industry is that the GPU is the best place to run you know, your, your AI analytics. And, uh, you know, I think the point that, you know, that we're trying to make here is, again, while we love GPUs and GPUs you know, are great, it's certainly not the only application out there. And in many cases, it's not the best application or the best solution for running uh, your application. And really what you, you want to do is you're looking at a deployment is you really kind of want to you know, open up your, your aperture, right? And un again, understanding what your use case is and what the criteria are and, and every, uh, all the KPIs you're trying to meet, uh, understand that there's a whole plethora of options out there and you want to look at, at really identifying the right solution, the most optimized solution for any particular application. Excellent. While we are out of time today, I want to thank AJ for joining us. Tim, um, if the audience has any follow-on questions, um, please reach out. Um, if you're looking for, uh, you know, analytics and um, deep learning capabilities, uh, definitely reach out to AJ and Tim and I are here to answer any questions as well. Um, so uh, thank you so much. And